So essentially what we are looking at today as the title of the slide says, it, we are looking at how to utilize genetic testing in the arsenal of tools available as a neurologist to you for assessing your cases, evaluating your cases and looking at outcomes for these cases as well. Because genetics, unlike other tools available to you, can also give you recurrence risk analysis. That if this particular child or adult is having this, what is the risk of another family member, such as the next child, having the same disorder? So I think, especially in the current environment, nationally, globally, and even considering our chosen professions, I think this is a very, very good quote which we can start off with. This basically talks about the living machinery which is each one of us and what we are going to be talking about today in essence is deciphering data from this living machinery. Making sense of the data which is coming from the DNA of this living machinery and very often much like what Dawkins says here, we also work sometimes like a blind watchmaker. We know things should fit but we are not perfect exactly what outcome is going to come. And very often through collaborations between geneticists such as myself and clinicians such as yourselves, we have a lot of eye-opening interactions. Very often for us, it's a great learning experience. And you would see so, through some examples that even sometimes for clinicians, it's a very nice learning experience for them. So this is an overall look, but quickly to talk about the team I represent, like I said at the outset, I am proud to lead a team of like-minded individuals and our goal, simply put, is to help us, help you, help your patients better. To do that, we have a wide variety of testing available and that starts right from preconception all the way to pediatric and adult testing. So we do it for several different stages and we have a wide variety of platforms available right from the simple karyotype all the way through NGS based cell free DNA analysis. So basically I've talked about our ECGI offerings. I'll be talking a little bit about NGS trying to demystify it without getting too much into complications and key considerations as well when you're prescribing a genetic test and looking more are spending more of our time looking at several different subtypes of neurological disorders and some interesting cases within them. So important thing is to determine whether there's a genetic component, if at all you can consider it, but very often you may not get family history, which is positive, but you're sure that the child is having a genetic disorder. So there you may want to consider or may not want to consider family history. And whether there's a recurrence risk or not is something definitely you face. Because in my experience, when I work with clinicians in the OPD, the most common question the patient would ask would be, what is wrong with my child? Right? And the next most common question is, what is the chance of this happening again? So that is something, like I said, genetics can help you determine. Which type of test do you want to determine, you know, for prescription, for which disorder? For example, if you have a spinocerebral ataxia, do you prescribe a whole exome? Do you, exp do you go for repeat expansion first? So you have different genetic tests available even for the same disorder, right? How do you interpret results of a test? Now, please remember that genetic tests are highly contextual to who is the test recommended for, Sorry, what is the condition. Hai. So, and very importantly, it's about ultimately translating whatever we have in context of output from genetic testing and translating that to something meaningful, either in terms of treatment, therapy, prognosis, diagnosis to the patient. So communicating the results of our findings to the patients is equally critical and there what we do is very often we provide support in terms of post-test counseling and post-test follow-up reviews as well because these are dynamic things for example you could have a VUS or a variant of uncertain significance but two months down the line when we work with you and we do segregation analysis that VUS could then be converted into a likely pathogenic variant 
and we have done this with clinicians in india similarly a vus just by reclassification by acmg in the coming year could become either benign or likely pathogenic or pathogenic so we actually do regular follow up and we review our cases even after a year just to see whether the acmg classification for that variant has changed so that kind of dynamic data is there in these reports so essentially if you're looking at tests you want to look at two things you want to look at resolution and genome coverage ideally your test should be here on the right upper quadrant because this gives you good resolution while covering almost all the chromosomes if not all of them so if you look at technology also it kind of maps the evolution earlier you had very good genome coverage but poor resolution then you had tests which could cover part of the genome at very very high resolution single base pair of dna but right now thanks to evolution of molecular technology molecular biology and molecular genetics you have the tools like chromosomal microarray and next generation sequencing which are able to give you single base pair dna change and screen the entire genome at the same time so high resolution high throughput scanning of the genome is done both with chromosomal microarray as well as next generation sequence so i will not spend more time on this these are essentially more details when you look at the Uh, material which is going to be shared with you you will get more information on this karyotyping is still the most widely prescribed test in the world because it's a very cost effective test and it gives you quick information about the genetic composition of the affected individual if you want to go for a finer resolution you can look at fluorescent in situ hybridization but very often the complex phenotypes you are dealing with in neurology cannot be resolved at this level have certain things like pcr mlpa and which is a probe based pcr and sanger sequencing these right now are isolated or narrowed down for certain cases where predominantly they are confirmatory they are not used for screening purposes because it's not cost effective and these are low throughput systems so it's basically single sample known location or known gene if you are interested you will go for this chromosomal microarrays and next generation sequencing give you good coverage good resolution and they are quite cost effective because these are machines or instruments which are designed to process multiple samples i always use this example since we are not sitting together or i am not speaking to you in person everyone on this call can give me a quick cheek swab i can take it barcode these samples or i put unique identifying oligos on either side of your dna sequence it together separate it out and then report each each of your particular sequences with context to any particular thing which needs to be analyzed so let's say i take somebody's uh, sample and process it for whole exome i can take another person and process it for a clinical exome i can take somebody else's let's say i take mine and i run an epilepsy panel screen on that so all this can be mixed together processed together separated reported individually so that is what we mean when we say ngs or next generation sequencing is high throughput and the same information is given on this slide which talks about massive parallel sequencing where we combine different samples together sequence them together separate the data and report it and of course this number of samples per run is largely dependent on your machine the capacity of the machine and the type of analysis you want to do so ngs gives us a lot of flexibility and it's made uh, it possible to bring molecular diagnostic to a lot of people in india so quickly going through the workflow for those who are interested and some of the scientists who want to take this up you have the registration isolation of the nuclear dna you basically have to fragment the dna to get it sequenced and then you go through a whole step of processes this is a different barcoding from the first step this is barcoding of the sample this is barcoding when i talked about adding those tags to the dna so you add the tags to the dna and then pull them so although i am mixing multiple samples each of them have a unique barcode combination then i do the sequencing of the pool not individual samples the entire pool is sequenced then there is data analysis 
and very importantly part of the data analysis which is done by bioinformatics is separating the data based on the barcodes so very often sometimes when you are looking at starting your own ngs labs this is not spoken to or discussed by vendors they basically will talk about you know get take this instrument it solves your problem but what i find a lot across india with a lot of clinicians who have taken the sequencing systems is unless you have a bioinformatician and a reporting team you end up with data but not information that is something i want everyone to consider who is planning to start up or exploring ngs as an option some parameters just for your reference i would like to before i get to the table i would like to bring your attention to these two particularly important things one is omim and the other is the acmg whose guidelines we follow for classification of variants while doing the analysis so what kind of sequencing system is being used what is the chemistry whether it's a custom one whether it's a ready made one what are the number of genes being covered what is the omim coverage in that particular chemistry what is the average depth that means how many times one particular fragment is going to be sequenced what is the on target coverage because all of these are what we call capture chemistry so that they focus on particular regions and do you have additional services for example we offer complementary cnv or deletion duplication analysis from ngs data and we also provide confirmatory sanger sequencing for the particular case so variants of course you would be familiar with how do we classify them as pathogenic likely pathogenic vus so on and so forth we follow the acmg guidelines which are provided pathogenic of course is a known disease causing variant which is reported earlier well documented one this can also sometimes be high frequency variants right likely pathogenic are those which are shown to be or known to be associated but their association is not having strong evidence or support so for example if i have a nonsense mutation i can look at classifying it as a likely pathogenic variant depending on its location and its effect even though it might not be widely reported earlier the most common one you find is the variant of uncertain significance and this literally means it's uncertain what it essentially tells you is this variant based on our analysis and our bioinformatic analysis seems to have a damaging effect on the gene function which can be associated with the given clinical indications however it cannot be proved at this point and the association is not strong enough currently to consider this a pathogenic variant that is what vus means and for those doctors who are looking at prenatal analysis vus should be resolved typically before you look at a prenatal analysis especially when it involves pregnancy decisions pregnancy decisions we strongly recommend not taking based on the basis of a variant of uncertain significance now that is all well and good but obviously this couple who has come to you now is planning for their next child what do we do then how do we resolve this vus right please remember it's dynamic classification so there is movement between these different categories and in terms of resolving vus multiple options are available the most common options we provide generally in our reports you will see please do targeted sequencing of the parents please please do targeting sequ targeted sequencing of family members so this comes under familial testing you will also look at the vus in terms of the clinical context because we have identified a vus because the correlation is not very strong but if you find it significantly strong you can always give us feedback saying look based on the kind of effects we have seen based on the existing literature that this particular region is having this we can look at reclassifying it as likely pathogenic or pathogen biochemical analysis also is a strong supporting evidence so if you look at all these things essentially it is adding evidence in favor of reclassifying that vus and i kept talking about pathogenic because we talked about an affected individual but we may say that look out of these two cases one of them is benign we don't want to consider it 
So I don't want to do targeted testing for two of these variants you put in my NGS data or you've given me my NGS report. I rather only check for one. So even that way, resolving a VUS is very useful. You also have transcript analysis, functional studies, which are a little more costly and time consuming. What are functional studies? Essentially, you have a lot of agencies in India who can use or mimic the mutation in animal models like rats or zebra fish. And you can then study the phenotypic effect or the manifestation of this particular mutation in that animal model and then correlate it with your clinical case. ClinVar, of course, would help you understand why this VUS is there, what is the classification, what is this for and against evidence. And then also you can look at whether you want to redefine this. Please do get back to us, my reporting team and I, with any cases where VUS is unresolved or you would like further resolution, we are happy to help. Like I said, while making the report, we were the blind watchmaker, but when discussing with you, it will be an eye-opening experience for us. Neurometabolic disorders, essentially, you are looking at disruption or dysfunction of metabolic pathways, which have a neurological impact. You have a wide range of symptoms. It can be all the way from newborns to adults. You do have a decline or a deficit increase in perception, motor and mental skills. You see a lot of overlapping clinical indications such as seizures, hypotonia, poor feeding and respiratory distress in infants and children. And you see general aggressive behavior, mood disorders and behavioral disorders. By no means is this are these two points exhaustive? They are just a quick synopsis of common symptoms. These need not be the only criteria. I am sure with your expertise and experience, you would have seen a broad range of symptoms which you would consider. So with this, what are some of the metabolic causes? You have amino acid metabolism disruption, organic acidemias and acidurias, carbohydrate metabolism disorders, LSDs, neural ceroid lipofuctionosis, Les Zellweger is another example and even urea cycle defects can be considered as neurometabolic disorders. So I will be moving on to the case studies. So the first one of course was a suspected case itself of NCL. So we offered to perform the clinexome sure or a clinical exome and we got a pathogenic variant in this particular gene. And if you see how to read this particular data for those of you who are not familiar with our reports, this particular column talks about what is the gene. This is its reference ID in Mendelian inheritance of man. So you can actually cross check if you put this ID in the OMIM portal, you will actually get this particular gene. Then you have the disease. What is it? NCL, which type? 7. What is the inheritance pattern? Autosomal recessive. And most of you would be available, aware on the today's call, autosomal recessive means it is present on chromosome 1 to 22, not X or Y. It is recessive, so you need two abnormal or non-functional copies for this disease to manifest. So are we having that in this case? We will find out soon. The nucleotide change is quite interesting. This is not happening in the coding region. It's not happening in the exon. It's actually happening at the junction of intron 2. You can see here exon under exon is written INT2. So this is actually an intronic splice site variant. There is no amino acid change, but there is a change in the splice site. What is the zygosity? Do we have one or two copies? You have two copies of the same variant. So this is called homozygous. What is the ACMG classification of this variant? It is pathogenic. What is this gene? This is a myosin heavy chain gene. Okay, you see recurrent seizures and neuroregression. We have done genetic counseling and we had confirmed this particular variant from NGS using Sanger and we had recommended targeted testing for this for his parents. Unfortunately, the parents did not get back to us, so we don't have a resolution for this. But this is one of those clear cut cases where we are very happy we could, you know, confirm the clinical diagnosis with genetic testing. Second case where suspected mucopolysaccharidosis was there. And interestingly, here, if you see the features, they are classical mucopolysaccharidosis where you have 
splenomegaly, hernia, coarseness in the face, global developmental delay, respiratory infections. But when we did our exome, we did not find any mutations which could clinically be reported. So we were stumped. But like I said, one of the additional supports we provide is we do CNV calling or copy number variation calling on such cases. And when we did CNV calling for this, we identified a possible homozygous deletion in exon 7 of IDSG. So very interesting. This was a small exonic deletion. And this, of course, this particular gene, of course, is associated with mucopolysaccharidosis, specifically Hunter's syndrome. It is X-linked recessive. And what we recommended for this particular case was doing an MLPA. And in fact, this case was confirmed by MLPA. So we have Dr. Ashutosh with us, and he had a very interesting case of uh, ectodermal dysplasia, where we had a similar outcome, again on the X chromosome, where it was a much larger deletion. And rather than MLPA, we confirmed the case through microarray as well. So that was a quite an interesting finding for us. to case 3. This is one of those eye openers where we both learned something new and it's very interesting. One year, eight month old male, developmental delay, febrile seizures and coarse facies again, depressed nasal bridge, myelin spots, frontal bossing, again suspected mucopolysaccharidosis. When we check the particular genes, there is no clinically significant variant. But here, unlike the previous case, we did not find any significant deletions also in this gene or duplications in this gene. However, we did find another variant, but a variant of uncertain significance. Sorry. Apologies. So we did find a variant of uncertain significance. So this particular gene, if you see, it is not involved in metabolism. Right? It is involved in formation of protein complexes and it is, it is associated with coffin series, autosomal dominant. This is happening in exon 20. This is the nucleic acid change, the protein change. It is heterozygous and as per the evidence of the impact of this change, it is classified as a variant of uncertain significance. So we actually reached out to the pediatric neurologist who had referred the case to us. As we often do, a lot of you on the call today, the senior clinicians as well as the residents would be getting frequent contacts from my reporting team about certain cases, about resolving certain cases. So we did this in this case, interestingly. And of course, if you look at the coffin series phenotype, there is a certain degree of overlap in it. There is overlap. It's not absolutely matching, but there is a certain degree of overlap. And one of those things are, of course, the hypoplastic fingernails and this thing. So when so what the doctors told us, what the neurologist told us is, look, I'll take a review, keep this variant, don't, don't, uh, you know, don't release this until I get the additional testing or confirmation done, and quickly, very quickly, uh, within uh, within a day or two, he reverted back to us saying that yes, this does fit. So for me, it was like for me and uh, my team at Eurofins, it was an eye-opening experience, saying that okay, although it was a partial overlap. This is something which need not be ignored because it does not fit the exact clinical indications. So very often what happens in such cases as a good practice, what we do is we do not discard such variants. We do not discard such variants. Like I said, a lot of times the outcome could be a VUS, which then later turns out to be benign. You check the parents, it's not there or the parents are asymptomatic and they're having it. So you also have this partially matching variants which we do not generally report because ACMG says has very clear guidelines on what you need to report and what incidental findings can be given. However, proactively from our side, we always communicate with you saying that, dear doctor, this particular sus suspected disorder, there are no clinically significant variants which directly have strong association with what you have asked. However, there are these particular variants of uncertain significance or LP variants, which do have partial match, 
but require this additional confirmation to be done or can be explored further. So with your consensus, with your consent, with your approval, we will then add them to the report. So in such cases, it becomes a novel experience for both of us where we relook at a case and we actually redefine this. Very often in case reviews, especially when you're dealing with pediatric cases, the phenotype will evolve. The clinical indication will evolve as the child grows. So we we always take it upon ourselves to get back to you and say, you know, after six months, after a year, if this child is coming back to you, dear doctors, anything has evolved. Especially when we have not reported anything significant or we have re released a non-report, we generally would sit with each clinician and try to review and find out what is the evolution of the clinical indication or phenotype and whether we can having any new indications to reassess the genotype. So this is something we actively practice. Right. Before I get to neuromuscular disorders, uh, I would quickly take a couple of minutes break. If there are any queries, questions or suggestions, please do feel free to go ahead. So could you please elaborate, Dr. Suresh? Paraneoplastic syndromes. Yes, there are genetic drivers for that. There are. There are genetic drivers. Perhaps what we can do is, uh, if you could share your contact with me or with Yogesh, I will actually get in touch with you one on one and we can explore specific syndromes you're looking at. There are genetic drivers for that. So if meningitis is a bit more tricky, uh, but uh, we can take a look at that. Very honestly, uh, Dr. Suresh, I would have to look into it. My team and I would have to look into it, if I'm being modest, and uh, we can explore that. I would not rule it out at present, but we would have to look into it, and then we would be able to come to a conclusion, because that is not something we commonly see referred for genetic testing. So that is something, uh, yeah, my pleasure, Dr. Suresh. Thank you. If there are no further questions, I will get back to the presentation. Thank you all. Okay, what is coverage analysis? How do we need to communicate? What are the indications for this? So Dr. Bala, you are asking essentially uh, on target versus off target coverage. It's a bit more of a technical thing. Uh, it's not uh, directly clinical. So essentially it shows you how much of your actual region was covered. Now what happens here is like I said, these are all probe based exomes. So if the probe is covering the region or not, it's critical for you to know because that impacts the quality of the data. Very often you get gene wise coverage or probe wise coverage as well. And uh, what do you mean by coverage analysis? Is there anything particular you would like to know? Is this more in terms of clinical context or is this more in terms of lab context? Because the conversation would change based on that. As a clinician. Right. So essentially, if you're looking at coverage of the gene, that tells you the quality of the data. If your gene is 100% covered for particular regions, please remember when the exome data comes as 100% covered, it is not covering your intronic regions. It may not be covering all your exons as well. It may not be covering all your exons as well. So if you're looking at 100% gene coverage, then you're not looking at either a clinical exome or a whole exome or even any kind of exome, you're looking at a whole genome there. So essentially, when we talk about exomes, you're looking at the coding region and a bit of the intron exon junction. We pick up deep intronic variants plus 100. So we go kind of deep into the intron. So that particular gene coverage would determine how good the data is. Conversely, 
the gene coverage can also give you hints and clues for deletions. Just because one sample is having low coverage in exon 7 of IDS gene, how do I know if this is a fault of the probe or is it a possible deletion in the sample? So I have separate software and a separate analytical pipeline which will then look at this, compare it with other samples, our existing data and interpret it whether this is a possible deletion or not. So that is what it would do. So as a clinician, coverage is important for you. You need to know coverage to look at the efficacy of the data which is being given to you and the results which have been given to you. You need good coverage on your on-target coverage. And generally, we would know our on-target coverage because this is something we keep reviewing. For example, certain genes would have low coverage and high coverage. And based on that, we would recommend our panels. So generally, any service provider gives you high coverage panels so that they're able to give you effective data. Right. Thank you, Dr. Vala. So coming to neuromuscular disorders, of course, these are disorders which affect the nerves which generally control the voluntary muscles and also sensory information. So when these neurons are affected, you get the following disorders where there's muscle loss, issues in movement and so on and so forth. These are some examples of neuromuscular disorders. I would not spend more time on this. I would go more into the case studies. The first case is where you have a classical thing where there's a clear suspicion of congenital muscular dystrophy, where you have elevated CPK, absent DTR, motor delays, and so on and so forth. This is a classical example where the clean exome sure gives us clear insight. You can see here this is limb girdle muscular dystrophy and congenital muscular dystrophy. So very often the gene may have multiple phenotypes or clinical indications associated with it. Generally what we do if there are three, four types and if the given clinical indications are clear, generally we will remove those which are not strongly associated with the clinical indications and we will put the ones which are more closely associated. And we also cross check whether the variant classification changes based on this. So that is also important. An interesting feature of this case, why I put it is, it is a mixture of two different types of variants in the same gene. So this is what we call as a compound, compound heterozygous, right? This is a recessive condition and this is a compound heterozygous. One of them is happening in the coding region here and the other, other one is happening in the splice site. So it's happening in the intron. So it's happening in the non-coding region. Both of these have combined, unfortunately, in this child to give rise to this particular disorder. So the parents need not always have the same mutation. If they are consanguineous, yes, the likelihood of them having the same mutation is more. However, even if they are non-consanguineous, you can expect to see recessive conditions showing up like this. So we do have a test called carrier screening and we get very, very interesting results. Carrier screening typically is done for parents who are asymptomatic but have positive family history of a disorder and they want to screen themselves for all recessive conditions and then we do a matching of those two parents to see if there's any genetic overlap. So if I had done a carrier screening for this couple, for Lama 2, I, essentially I would have seen one of the parents would have this particular variant in heterozygous copy, so they are unaffected. This part, the other parent has this particular variant in heterozygous copy, they are unaffected. But the risk of having an affected child is now 25%. So did that uh, work out here? What did we do? We said, okay, we did the counseling and we confirmed these two variants in the proband. And then when we tested the parents, we actually found both of them to be carriers, one each. So therefore, for their next child, they're able to plan what testing needs to be done. They need not look at doing an NGS panel again for the next child. Instead of that, they can do a very simple, targeted, cost-effective Sanger sequence. Case 2 was interesting because where we got this as an SMA with RD, suspicion of SMA with RD. And if you look, if you look at this, what we found is a combination of a pathogenic and a likely pathogenic variant. And again, 
if you see this particular gene it is associated with neuropathy hereditary motor neuropathy distal type combination of two mutations one pathogenic one likely pathogenic and if you look at the gene and what its associated symptoms are it's a perfect match so one of those major indications given by the doctor to us was the ventilator dependence which we could clearly see as one of the associated symptoms for mutations with this gene and again we did the counseling we confirmed the variant in the child and we confirmed the parents also being carriers here before i get to epilepsies th those were just two examples and again if you see there's a common trend here essentially what we do is based on okay uh, i will answer your question dr suresh just uh, one one moment please i'll be taking a one minute break so i'll answer your questions then so you generally see a very common consistent theme that you do a ngs based screen and then you do confirmatory testing and then you test for associated family members so as a geneticist we often say we start with one but we don't stop at one so you start with one person and because you're looking at risk of recurrence you're looking essentially at risk of recurrence you have to continue doing it for the parents to see whether this was inherited or de novo even if it is de novo let's say you have an autosomal dominant one where you have an autosomal dominant mutation even if it is de novo you still would want to check the next child or the fetus prenatally whether that mutation is reoccurred or not so even there you would have to have one more test at least and what happens here to incorporate dr suresh's question so how is value added to ngs when you compare it with sanger sequencing so ngs for example if you take a clinical exome dr suresh you would be able to check 17000 genes in one shot 17000 genes which gives you a very very broad scope of analysis so rather than a sanger where i would be looking at a single gene and if that single gene is not having the mutation then we are at a loss we don't have an answer so ngs allows us to very cost effectively look at a large number of genes in your patient sample and assess for example if you remember that case earlier i discussed about mucopolysaccharidosis imagine i had done a very small panel or sanger sequencing for those genes i would not have come up with a possible answer for that clinician he would not have gone back to his case reviewed it and said yes this can actually fit here so that is one of the benefits and the advantages of using ngs it allows you to screen for a wide number of genes in fact it allows you to screen for up to 22000 genes in the whole exome or if you are doing the whole whole genome well it's looking at the entire genomic content and it does it in a very cost effective manner as well so it doesn't overburden the patient happy to be of help dr suresh again i uh, i hope that my discussion is not too technical or very is not too confusing if you'd like me to slow down explain something more please feel free to stop and ask me uh, if not i will carry on further i'll just take a quick one minute break here. Uh, so sutopa what we would recommend is based if that P pgd would be uh, done on a case to case basis depending if you if you have the mutation known then we can explore it currently uh, i am looking at pgd in terms of validation for some common disorders but definitely if there's a case where you know we can offer pgd we can discuss it and look at it uh, generally for vus i would not strongly recommend it maybe we can look at classifying that vus into a likely pathogenic or pathogenic one 
So if you are looking at uh, something like an NCL, generally in NCLs you do get a lot of LPs and pathogenics. So there, yes. In fact, we in my early organization we did work for NCL. One of those cases for NCL. Yep, exactly, exactly, Sutapa. So for pathogenic mutations, yes. So you could let me know maybe offline what you are looking at and whether I can give you the solution. I will let you know. Yeah. Right, because there you are essentially looking at few cells and whether this requires additional markers, presence of pseudogenes, all of those would impact because you're working not with genomic DNA. When you work preconception, you're working with whole genome amplified product. So it gets a bit tricky there. Happy to be of help. And uh, apologies if I'm kind of, you know, a little bit uh, going through case studies quite quickly. For me, it's very often not how little I can do, but there are too many cases. I, I actually work in coordination with my reporting team for all this and they have sent me n number of lists. Sir, all these cases, Dr. Sam, are very interesting. And unfortunately, I have the task of slimming it down and making the content. So I'm trying to incorporate cases which are interesting from a point of view as clinicians also. And it challenged us as geneticists as well. And most often, you know, whether we were able to resolve or not, to be perfectly honest, there are cases where you know there's a very strong phenotype and we just don't get the underlying genotype, genotypic changes. Uh, before I get into the epilepsy and other things, there's a very interesting case I would like to share with you. Interestingly, although this was related to autism, it was brought to my notice by a fertility specialist. Thank you, Sutopa. Actually, you gave me an idea. I can talk about this case. Very interesting here. You have two brothers in this family, both on the autism spectrum both of them on the autism spectrum. Parents are worried because both their children are autistic and on the spectrum and they're worried if their next child is going to have it. Now autism is un unfortunately some forms of it are polygenic, non-genetic. You have, you know, alleles which are really not strongly associated. So it's a quandary for us. Always as a geneticist, it's a quandary for us. What do we do? So. We looked at a little bit of background over there. So we asked for the first child, any genetic test was done. And they say, yes, genetic test was done. They found a duplication and it was uh, it was checked in the parents. They did a microarray. They found a duplication in one of the chromosomes. It was a pathogenic duplication associated with ASD. OK, so what is the OK? So parents are negative. Child is having it. OK, and the second uh, second brother, what happened? Oh, we did the micro array for him. He's negative, but he is still showing ASD. He's on the spectrum. Now the parents are worried. They're saying, okay, there is something in us, something in this family. There's high risk. We are extremely worried about this child. So we get into a little bit more. Since I'm again to reiterate, I'm sitting with a fertility specialist at this point. I'm not sitting with a neurologist in the in this point of the discussion so we get back and we backtrack we don't go directly to the neurologist we first go to the OBGYN and then we talk to them and interestingly she says that the younger brother during delivery had asphyxiation with the cord which can result in hypoxia and hypoxia can manifest in ASD as well so you have a highly likely probable non-genetic cause for the younger sibling we did say that, okay, if you'd like us to do a genetic screen for both parents and the child as well, we can do a trio or quad analysis. But if it is an existing evidence, the first child has a de novo genetic cause. The second child superficially right now with the existing information of microarray doesn't seem to have a genetic cause. But we did recommend for doing a genetic screen for both of them. So these kind of conversations and this level of engagement is very often required. And we did backtrack to the neurologist as well in the end. So I started off with a fertility specialist who wanted to do PG. They wanted to do PGS and PGD for this case. Went back to the OBGYN and then went to the neurologist for this case. So very often as genetic counselors, we have very long term relationships with cases. In fact, my uh, there is one couple who are, we, I'm trying to help out and they have been with me for over four years. So we're still working together and trying to resolve their issues. So that is the kind of thing we see as geneticists. Right, so again, quick classification of seizures. I need not get into defining seizures to this particular audience. 
so I would not take more time on that. This is just a classification in 2017. Uh, please do let me know if there's a more evolved classification. I would love to incorporate it and love to understand that. So this again was a classical, uh, this thing, very, very, you know, characteristic phenotype. So the neurologist who's from one of the national institutes just said straightforward, this is Dravet. Do it, confirm it and let me know. So we did it, we confirmed it and we reverted back. So again, it's a very, very straightforward mutation. It is, it's a channelopathy, this is a sodium channel gene and that is also very, very clearly a pathogenic variant. We did get another case. I would not spend more time on this. So uh, we did get another case, three month old female. Here what happened is that the information given to us is only recurrent frequent seizures. Other information is not available. We follow up with the doctor and the doctor says, okay, I will try to get more information for you when the patient visits again. However, here also we were able to give a likely pathogenic variant and here again, it's a different channel. Here it's a potassium channel, but please be aware, even if you're working in EIEE -E -E cases, it is not always associated with channelopathies. So it, you can have, you have to look beyond sodium, potassium, calcium channels when you're looking at EIEE -E cases. So that is something important and that's why our panel also includes non-channel genes in the EIE -E panel. So again, this is basically the details of the gene. This interestingly, this particular potassium channel is expressed largely in the brain tissue associated with seizures, delayed psychomotor development and mental retardation. So when we got this information, we did talk to the clinician saying that, look, this likely pathogenic variant is there. Would you like to report it? He said, yes, go ahead and report it. And when they correlated and they did their additional understanding, a lot of these particular symptoms which are associated with this mu gene and its mutations were seen in the child. I'll take a little detour from clinical case studies. Uh, so this is uh, a year old data, but I thought I would share it today. And I hope uh, a lot of the clinicians today would have seen this data or looked into the study details. It's a wonderful study on epilepsy in terms of genetic analysis. So this is something which started in 2014 as uh, genome projects do take a bit of time to mature and deliver data. And what happened is from 2014 onwards, the target was to sequence 25,000 individuals. So the EPI 25 project was for 25,000 individuals, a mix of people with epilepsy and without your positive cases and your controls and understanding at the exome or whole exome level, what are the underlying genes with different types of epilepsies? and what are some of the most common mutations coming. For any geneticist, this is a boon because this forms now a very, very relevant data set, data set and even a database for us where we can improve our panels, improve our variants and also understand if we can provide any kind of simpler solutions for certain disorders. For example, if I find that there are high frequency mutations in the Indian population for a particular neurological disorder, I can look at creating a smaller panel which covers those particular genes. If it comes down to the level of common mutations, I can say that, okay, if you're very strongly associating this particular thing, then you might, might want to look at this mutation first, then look at looking at a group of genes through NGS. So always this kind of population data helps us in better understanding the genotype phenotype correlations and narrowing it down further. So this was the critical findings in the study, which again, the article beautifully kind of summarized in a single slide for us. So you had particular genes which are very, very prominently associated with epileptic encephalopathies. You have genes which are prominently associated for generalized epilepsies and genes which are associated for focal epilepsies. So this is very, very succinct data from a huge pool. So they basically work with 17,606 people. Although they tried, their original target was 25,000, they were able to give data 
for 17,606 people. So it's an amazing study. I'm sure a lot of you would be familiar with it. And it was very interesting. I thought I would share it today just as a viewpoint on the other side that we need also to do such kind of activities, especially with disorders which are rare, not so rare, but require proper phenotyping and genotyping to be done together. Because a lot of these, if you look at the correlation, how it is made is a lot of these patients may not have similar phenotypes, may not have exactly the same phenotypes, but their genotypes might be the same, especially when you're working with dominant conditions such as SEN1A. So that particular thing is very, very important. I thought I'd share this and highlight it. This pretty much concludes my, you know, standard cases. And there are a few rare ones which I will talk about next. Again, if there are any questions uh, and if there is any feedback, if there's any additional information, any of the clinicians or geneticists on the call today would like to share about this study or any similar studies, I think this is a good point. We can discuss that as well. Again, I would be taking a one minute break here. Thank you for those kind words, Dr. Suresh. I'm happy um, to be able to share information with you and get your feedback as well. So any other similar studies which were done for any other neurological disorders and anything like that, or if you have any plans for doing this kind of research, because it's, it's, it is an incredible value to us as geneticists. Uh, so that would really help us, you know, that would really be an eye opener for us blind watchmakers. So please do let us know as well, because this is something we constantly strive to do. You know, we always want to follow up, resolve things, right? So we truly believe these kind of exercises would help us help you help them. So coming to our last three cases, which again, these are two neurodegenerative disorders where Unfortunately or fortunately, in the last year, I'm seeing a bit of a rise in this particular uh, uh, type of disorder. And uh, any of the neurologists can also give me your feedback, doctors, whether you are also seeing more and more cases. Because I have come across more cases of YOPD in the last year compared to the you know two, three years earlier when I was working in this YOPD cases, I'm seeing more and more of them. So this is very interesting. It was a 39 year old female suspected of YOPD with dystonia and hypotonia of muscle. But we found it in DCTN. It was a VUS and associated with Perry syndrome. Of course, it's a progressive brain disease, including Parkinsonism, psychiatric changes. And usually it appears in the mid 40s or early 40s to 50s. So this particular thing, interestingly, if you look at the age, it was right on the border of that. So this seemed to be a good fit. We spoke to the doctor. The doctor said, yes, you can report this variant and please confirm it. So we have done that. Unfortunately, further testing, the patient opted out of, out of. And so we couldn't get a segregation analysis to resolve this VUS. This is These are some of the unresolved VUS which are with us. But again, I thought I'd put this because we do get cases of this. And I am seeing uh, more cases of Parkinsonism coming across, especially young onset. This was one where it was a suspected case of uh, CJD and we got a straight variant here. It was a straight pathogenic variant in PR and PG. Uh, we not only did Sanger sequencing for this particular individual, he also had an affected brother for whom we recommended Sanger sequencing and he also was positive for the same mutation. It was quite interesting because neither parent was. Both parents were not having this mutation, but both the brothers were. So we were looking at this particular case for further testing. This is a case where I just use this to illustrate the power and you know potential of genetic screening 
of different microarrays essentially when you are looking at uh, asd spectrum or intellectual disabilities there are differing viewpoints now if you ask different geneticists some some will tell you go for a whole exome some would tell you go for a microarray some would tell you like me that you can start off with a microarray and if it's not working out please let us know whether you'd like us to do a whole exome so essentially why i would recommend a microarray is both are screens right we are screening here we are not having a very clearly defined clinical indication or phenotype we are screening here so we need to cast a broad net presently a microarray is far more cost effective when you are casting that net than a whole exome of course with evolution in technology the whole exome prices also are significantly coming down but still they yet, yet to match the range of a microarray so it's quite cost effective to screen using a microarray wherein the patient would want to consider okay even if the microarray is negative what do you recommend doctor let's go for a whole exome okay let's look at a whole exome as well so in this particular case again we had a copy number on chromosome 10 which is strongly associated with this yes yes dr nelly so it will be shared mr yogesh would be uh, sending it if you have shared your email id with him uh, or the team then we would be sharing it with you so here you have a likely pathogenic variant and again uh, similar to that case of the two siblings which i talked about earlier but just because there's a duplication we don't directly correlate that but if you see GPRIN2 gene is located there and it is associated with the ASD spectrum. So again all these reports are given after discussion with doctor and very often we have a lot of follow up. First we follow up for counseling then we follow up for case reviews especially when the cases are negative we are quite you know and we are very thankful to our doctors because they have a very hectic schedule we understand the kind of case loads and workloads so we very often request them even sometimes to the point of irritation but we do request them because we want to gain more insight into these cases especially with pediatric cases because the phenotype really evolves we do get a lot of differences in the phenotype as the child grows up so we would like to track that and see okay look we might not have considered these genes because we didn't have these particular symptoms at that age but now we are getting additional symptoms coming oh we got some new information in neuromuscular disorders okay initially when it was sent sample was sent to us there was no muscle biopsy okay maybe couple of months down the line after we released the report maybe it was a null report maybe it was a vus muscle biopsy confirms it okay biochemical tests confirm this okay then we can reclassify this variant so that kind of follow up is is there from our side because just like you we want to come to a resolution for this particular case Yes so definitely we would be sharing that This is something uh, we I borrowed from the army so it's their 5p rule so it's essentially proper planning prevents poor performance so we we mutate this since we are geneticists we took took the liberty of mutating this and saying proper phenotyping clinical indications prevents poor test performance of course this is said in jest because a lot of you provide a lot of information whenever we call you back uh, you know you always are ready to give us additional clinical details but very often or uh, earlier i should say before we started this kind of initiatives i used to get very very small i mean very small uh, phenotypic details i had a, a person who wanted to do a clinical exome for a case where there was excessive sweat, sweating in the patient and that was the only clinical indication provided to us patient has excessive sweating kindly do a clinical exam for this case so we do come across that cases we do come across very vague phenotyping in some psychiatric disorders neuropsychiatric disorders when very often when we probe it we find that this is you know maybe it has not come through the proper channel sometimes because clinicians usually will not write vague phenotypes they have a clear idea but if the case itself is vague they will say okay look i want you to screen for bigger things and remember as a rule in genetics the more broad your phenotype or clinical indications the bigger the panel will be for testing right we are hoping to change that because i also believe that by and large 
much like the rest of the world, we are slowly starting to shift more and more into two separate segments. One where you have very focused small gene panels and the other one we are moving towards what are called cost effective whole exomes. So these intermediate panels which we currently have, I think given a few years time, they will disappear into these two extremes where you have small targeted panels for those patients with a very clear phenotype and for a slightly ambiguous phenotype or a phenotype which is have possibly you know having different disorders it could be associated with different disorders you have the whole exome sitting at the other side with that again i would really like to thank each and every one of you for your patient hearing understanding and your feedback and the points we discussed as well i would actually open up the session for questions if you'd like me to go back to any particular slide and you know have a discussion on that if you would like to share your experience with some other cases and you know give your feedback on that or any unique findings from your side you would like to discuss that i open up the forum for that thank you one and all for attending today and interacting with us so yogesh i i Yogesh is very prompt. I was going to remind him he did it. <laughs> so I, I owe him a lot of credit because he organizes these things and you know he schedules these things as well. So Yogesh is our marketing manager. So credit goes to him as well for this particular organizing this, putting this together, and we kind of visualize it. He implements it. So a lot of credit goes to him as well. So I. Right. So again, uh, to all the clinicians, scientists, geneticists on today's call, uh, thank you so much for your time. And we are definitely, you know, looking forward to learning from each and every one of you. Uh, that is part of the exercise. This is essentially, essentially sharing our findings and you know our, uh, what is the road so far. But we would really look forward to learn from each and every one of you. With that, if there are no further questions. or if there are questions you can please uh, email me and let me know if if there is nothing further with everyone's permission i'll actually close the call thank you all so much thank you so much dr zatar for the kind words uh, thank you all so much for the attending today's session please do give us your feedback and uh, keep in touch with us have a great weekend and uh, maybe continue to decipher the data of those machines thank you one and all